The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Ben? Oh, no. Oh, I stayed up late last night. I stayed here because I couldn't stop working on the ZX Spectrum. I wired up the Z80 part of it all by hand. I don't know what I was thinking. I was mad with insanity. I just couldn't stop until I passed off from exhaustion. You know what we could do today once I wake up is we could keep building the ZX Spectrum, wire the video portion of it by hand, and see if we could connect that together with the Z80 module that I built last night. Let's get started. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. In the previous episode, we replaced the video RAM for the video processor on the Z80. Today's episode, we're going to do something similar, but for the Z80 processor itself. So let me show you what I did. I built this module, and this is basically a Z80 computer module. So here's what it contains. There's a Z80 processor, obviously, and this is a Z80A, which means it can go in excess of four megahertz, even though it'll only be at 3.5. And there's a crystal built into the circuit just for testing purposes. This, well, actually there's a switch under the chip that allows you to deactivate this crystal and use an external clock, which it will. These two chips, it's an AND gate and a NOT gate, yes. Uh, these are used for memory decoding. The ROM sits at the bottom 16K of memory, and the RAM sits at the top 32K of memory, which means there's a second 16K bank that is reserved for the video RAM. So what these chips do is they basically take the address signals off of the Z80 and uh, enable this chip or this chip. Um, each ROM and RAM chip have a couple output enable and chip enable lines which basically do the same thing. And by connecting those in a certain way, you can control whether or not the chip is active or not or in tri-state. So when it's reading the ROM, you, it means it can be sending all the same bus signals as this thing. So if this thing is not enabled, even though it's getting those signals, it shouldn't be outputting bits to the data line. So when this thing is at addressing this, this is disabled and vice versa. Same thing with the video RAM, although that's controlled by the ULA chip. Uh, the ZX Spectrum is a very simple machine. Really, the ZX Spectrum is the ULA video chip. Otherwise, it's basically a generic Z80 computer. I mean, this chip is really what differentiates this from like a ColecoVision or a Sega Master System. So my idea here is to take this module that I made and plug it into another module. So there'll be a second module, which is actually the video. And I made them in modules so I can make sure one works before I make the other one. And then once they're both working, I can plug them together. The other thing about modules that's nice is I can plug them back into the system using this bus bridge that I made. Uh, I've got all these pinouts written down someplace, but I know the order to put this back together. Oh yeah, so. All my ultra ATA wiring that I did. So this is actually three points of bus. There's the bus here, here, and here, and then it also goes here. Actually, no, there's four points of the bus because we have it on the chip, the ROM, and the RAM, and the expansion. One thing that was really nice about the Z80 is it had this um, expansion bus right here. Even signals that the ZX Spectrum didn't use, like Z80 bus acknowledge, they're out here, which was really handy for the peripherals. The peripherals could take complete control of the system. All right, so this is a expansion socket that I made. What I did was I took a regular socket and I soldered wires to it. So you can basically plug in all this stuff as, see how the ROM is missing and the RAM is missing? You can plug this in as the Z80 and everything will still work because it's all on a bus. The reason I didn't use a header like this is because if you pressed it into those sockets, it would permanently bend them out and you wouldn't get a very good connection. This is basically another memory decoding chip. Uh, we have two separate set sets of schematics. This is an older ZX Spectrum, whereas this is basically the last model that existed, so it's been optimized. The older version had six integrated circuits in place of that large IC that I showed you. 
and you can see them here, 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 and then there's, oh yeah, there's some logic gates down here. And all this does is it basically takes the 16-bit bus and it turns it into uh, two different buses so it can address the single bit uh, RAM. But we have modern RAM now, so we don't need to do that. So instead of having this large uh, DIP40, we can get away with just two smaller gates like this. All right, let's figure out a base layout. We have our two multiplexer chips. I'm gonna put them right here so the data comes in and goes through those first. Then the multiplexer chips go into the ULA. All right. Then the ULA goes through a flip-flop, which I guess maybe goes here. And then the flip-flop goes to the RAM, the video RAM. We're gonna use the same chip as this, although we only need to use the bottom 16K of it. And then there's a uh, TV modulator chip, which will turn these signals into PAL signals. That's a DIP18. This is a decent layout. I mean, I need a, probably a little bit more space here for the connectors. So the idea is we basically take the video circuit and the Z80 circuit, plug them together, and then that will be a ZX spectrum. Hopefully. Assuming it all works. If it all works, then it will work. I've got the headers connected here. They took up a lot of space, but oh well. So here are the multiplexers that appear here. And here is where the ULA is going to go. So I'm gonna do this one step at a time. The first thing I'm gonna do is connect the address bus to the multiplexers and then connect the multiplexers to the ULA. All right, I've got the chips in position. This drawing here is the pinout of this. So what I'm gonna do first is attach the address lines, these 16 lines here, to these multiplexers. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna take the 16 address lines and actually slice it in half. And the ULA is going to access those seven bits at a time. That's just the way it works. It's actually not very efficient, but I have to wire it that way in order to use the ULA, so oh well. Here are the first 14 address lines connected to the multiplexers. So the multiplexer chips are good. The multiplexer chips go here. The address lines go into them. They're decoded and then sent to the ULA. If you look closely here, you see that there are some resistors, uh, inline resistors for the address bus coming in. And there's also resistors for the data lines. The buses are isolated at times on the ZX Spectrum. When it's drawing the picture, it's using some of the video RAM and the ULA won't let the CPU access that RAM if the ULA is using it. So the ULA actually drives the Z80 through the clock line. So it's in control. The Z80 just thinks it's in control. So I've got these address lines hooked up. The next thing I'm gonna do is attach the data lines from here to the pull-up resistors, and then I can start attaching the RAM to the video. Now it's time for a tech timeout. Today's tech timeout, I thought I would show you another improvement I have made to my replicator printer. So originally the spools would sit back behind the printer like that. It's compact, but they would bind up and they're also hard to remove. I made an improvement. I laser cut this thing, which I used for quite a while. This sat behind the printer and uh, the spools move pretty good and also it was really easy to remove them. I could just lift them out and then pop the cap off and change out the spools. But they would still have the binding problem where if the spool doesn't rotate enough, see that? It'll bind up. And that's actually one of the biggest causes of print failures, at least on my machine. So the solution is to mount the spools above the machine. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do this. It's pretty common, but now I have. So I laser cut this frame, and then I just use a PVC pipe, either a thin pipe for this brand of spool or a thicker pipe for the official MakerBot filament. And yeah, it works really good. I've printed very long prints on this and not had to go back and slack the spool at all. So yeah, if you have a 3D printer and you're having trouble with your spooler, put it above the printer. Here's what I wired up so far. We have these two multiplexers 
replacing this large chip. Now the RAM on this older system, you know, it was, it's actually eight one-bit RAMs to create a byte and they're accessed in parallel. But we don't have that anymore, we have parallel RAM. So we can actually reduce the amount of circuitry needed to address these chips. So this, actually, this chip here actually replaces about six chips in the older ZX Spectrums, but we can reduce it down even further. So since we're addressing this RAM directly from the Z80, we don't need half of this here. And then the other half of it, which basically uh, turns the RAM into two banks for the ULA, we've replaced with these two chips here. So this should basically, this chip is gone. And these chips are smaller, physically smaller. And again, yeah, we could have probably done this with surface mount or design to board, but this is just a fun challenge. So the ULA is gonna go here. Here is the RAM for the ULA, which is this. Here is the flip-flop, which again, replaces how this can access the RAM. And then this is going to be the, basically this is a, uh, you know, TV signal chip. So this sends YUV to this chip and that uses a circuitry to convert it to a PAL signal. So the brick wall we've kind of run into here as far as our parts are these high speed switching transistors. Like this one right here, for instance, takes the clock from the ULA and divides it in half and sends it to the Z80. See, there's a 14 megahertz crystal going into this, which is divided by two. And it's divided by two again to give a 3.5 megahertz clock speed for the Z80. We don't have any transistors that are fast enough here, so we're gonna have to order some. That'll have to be in the next part. Another challenge that we have is we need to attach the keyboard connector yet. The keyboard on this was done very, very, very crudely. It's actually scanned through the address bus. So on the matrix of the keys, eight of them are actually the top half of the address bus, A8 through A15. So when you access the port with a certain MSB, most significant byte, you'll actually get different keys. So if you want to see a certain row of keys, you would access like FFFE. If you want to see the next row down, you watch FDFE and so forth. So we'll probably have to piggyback. Here's the address lines right here. Probably have to make a piggyback connector right here for the keyboard. And then another five lines come from the ULA itself. So that's as far as we've gotten. Uh, while we wait for the resistors, we can talk about how we're gonna design the case. Let's do a drawing to see how this portable ZX Spectrum might look. I'm not gonna chop this board down until I know all the components are working. So I can still build this way or this way if I have to, so I'm gonna leave it there. But we can get a basic shape. So again, I'm just gonna use my pencil. Okay, so that's like the minimum size the components will take. So here's a screen, I got these from Amazon. This is the same screen we used in the Raspberry Pi portable that we built whenever that was. So these could accept NTSC or PAL, which is great because ZX Spectrum is PAL. The circuit board sticks out a little bit here. Eh, we could probably saw it down a little bit, but I'd rather not. Let's see here. So the trick with LCDs is um, the LCD and the PCB aren't usually symmetrical to each other. See, there's more space here than there is here. So what you do is you find the center of the screen then you come out the minimum distance like that and then you have to come out that same distance over here even though there might be a gap. But that's just the nature of the beast. So that's the screen. So the screen is centered to the circuits. And then we need to come out a little bit more for the case. Man, that screen adds a lot of width, but oh well. Okay, this is a ballpark for us here. Of course, we're also gonna need a decent amount of width for the keys. Curve the bottom. Oh look, we designed a Game Boy. All right. All 
Oh, I'm not gonna get a golden ratio out of this. Oh well. Okay, so the screen is, we'll put, put the screen up as high as we can. We're not gonna be able to get any uh, dynamic symmetry here or here, but what we'll probably do is whatever this space is, I'm sorry, whatever this space is, we'll make this space one half of it. That way it'll have, that's just how you make things look good. It's science or something. Just look up, uh, you know, golden ratio on YouTube and it will explain everything. Uh, so if this is here, we want the keyboard as high as possible because the meat of your hands is holding it, which means your thumb is gonna do the keys, which means the higher the keys are up, the easier it is to hold. So if we put this circuit board back in here, we see this, remember when we talked about how we'd have to use the address lines to hook up the keyboard? That is pretty much right at the center. So the keyboard could attach here. So from a side view, well, let's see. The key, if this is the screen and these are the keys, then all the circuitry is down here. The center point, keyboard could connect into it like that. Because a big part of designing this stuff is not just figuring out where everything fits, but figuring out how it goes together. Because if you're trying to save space, um, it's even more crucial. As far as the keys themselves, let's try something. I'm gonna cut a piece of funky foam, of course, that is the same width as this, and I guess I might as well make it the same height, too. Or, I should say, the same height as the area the keys will fit in. Yes, that's right, tack switches. Let's lay out some switches and see if we can actually hit them with our thumbs. So, let's say I'm holding this with my thumbs. Yeah, it's pretty easy to discreetly hit them. But we also need some space around these buttons so we can laser etch what they are. Because on the ZX Spectrum, each key does like 10 things. Very efficient. I think we can probably make it work. So what I'm gonna try to do when I design it is um, find some tack switches that are a little bit taller than this one. So on the case, let's say that's your top substrate, which will probably be engraving plastic cut with the laser. If the tack switch is here, like that, these would, would not stick to the surface. So we need a tack switch that's about seven millimeters high. By the way, tack switches are measured from the base to the height of the actuator, not the height of the actuator. So this total height needs to be seven millimeters, because I believe these are like 4.5. Then you have the top surface of your case and the buttons will stick to the surface of it. Um, if we tried to make individual keys, the keys would have to be larger than the buttons just because of how things work. And there'd be a lot more uh, possibility that they would kind of mush together. But by actually just touching the tops of the tack switches, we give it a lot more tactile <laughs> separation. So it's easier not to fat finger it. So yeah, I think that will probably work. As far as where the batteries go, um, we might actually be able to, uh, if, this, if this is here, and assuming the circuit board does not change in size too much, um, this battery pack should run as ZX Spectrum. We should actually test it, but for now, it, it probably will run it. Now there's two cells in here. This is a 7.4 volt lithium ion pack. If we split it in half, which is exactly what we did in the Raspberry Pi project, we could have one cell on the left and one on the right. And the advantage to that is when we draw something like this, let's see here, draw this actual scale. Let's, let's say that's our circuitry going to be about three-eighths of an inch thick. If you put the batteries behind it, that increases the total thickness of the unit to probably, oh, I don't know, inch and a quarter. Then, of course, the screen needs to be on top of that. The keys need to be on top of that, and all that adds up. But if we have the battery beside the circuits, it's on the same level as the circuits, and the battery is 
thicker than the circuits. So we have it like that. Then we still need to have the screen on top and the keys and the case. Well, actually we can estimate how thick that'll be. We'll just stick it together. Okay, so that's there probably. I'll probably want to put a heat sink on that guy, but well, whatever. So here's the circuitry with the socketed chips, the screen on top of it. The screen will actually be a little bit higher than it appears here. The switches on top of the battery. The battery will be on the side of the circuit. And uh, it's not too bad. I think this whole thing would probably be total thickness, probably an inch and a quarter. Uh, it's actually, you know, bought the same thickness as the original unit, but of course this one has everything inside of it. If we can find the right high-speed transistors to complete the ZX Spectrum on this breadboard, I think this small size should be achievable. The next step with the ZX Spectrum will be to take this design and draw it into the computer so we can make a cool custom case along with a battery, charger circuit, and screen, and keyboard. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be using the Raspberry Pi along with the camera module to build a customized, user-movable web shop cam. We'll see you then. She's like, I wish a goblin would take my brother, and then David Bowie comes in, and he's like, I've got your brother. And then she's like, no! And then she goes into a labyrinth and there's a worm. And the worm's like, oh, I'm just a worm! And then she's like, oh, okay. Don't you have a home? Zombie baby. <laughs> what time is it? Um, work time? Working on the ZX Spectrum, I just got into a groove, you know? And you've got to move and, you no. Know. No scripts, yay. Wait, Richard Simmons is the workout guy? That technology already exists, it's called a window. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.